Well, hello there. Fancy meeting you. Hello, good morning, uh, Professor Rosemary Cramp. It's, it's an honour to, to, to be able to, uh, to interview for the Meet the Archaeologist series. Um, I suppose, first of all, could you just introduce yourself uh, and your, your, your archaeological interests briefly? Well, as you know, I'm now an emeritus professor, but still working away at things. And um, I began life, actually, thinking I was going to be a Roman archaeologist when I was a child and when I first went to Oxford because there wasn't anything except much Roman except Roman archaeology there and when I was at Oxford I was reading English and read old English and then older and older English so I mainly did sort of uh, early Germanic and it struck me there was not there were not many people really working in the field of um, the Anglo-Saxon archaeology of England mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, really, there were very, very few sites. I would have said my life in archaeology has advanced with the subject. <laughs> <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't really much of a subject before, but mm. now a great deal has happened. Mm. And in the way that one does change when one gets to different places, I became a monastic archaeologist and a Northumbrian settlement and early medieval settlement when I came to the north because those were the opportunities that presented themselves. Mm, mm. And then I have this other sideline um, which I don't again know quite how I got into it but it was to, it is to record all the earliest sculpture from, the British, from England and uh, that's the Corpus of Anglo-Saxon Stone Sculpture mm -hmm. of which we're about to do the 13th volume and um, ease our way gradually through England. We've nearly finished. Right, wonderful. Um, just very briefly, that, that was the post arriving, if anyone was wondering what that noise was. Um, now, um, excellent. Uh, I have to say, it's, it's one of those things, strange things where um, when I was uh, doing my degree at this, at this university, um, I would see, you know, your portrait on the wall, and I have to say, much to my shame, I thought you were dead. I didn't realize you were, you were alive. I thought I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason why I say You didn't that, see my ghost walking around the department. Well, I have to say, the first time I saw you, I did go, <laughs> I was slightly stunned. But the reason why I say that, sorry, is not, not to offend you, but rather to um, to underline the fact that uh, it's quite clear that, that, that yes, you, your interests lie with Old English and um, Saxon settlements and and this kind of thing, and that's what you're most well known for. But also as well, your career has been tied in with so much, um, for example, uh, the beginnings of the, the Institute of Field Archaeologists, this mm, kind of thing, mm. um, uh, and other developments in the, in the profession, um, that uh, not only do you come across as a fairly venerable figure, but also you, you must have a great deal of, of experience and opinion when it comes to how, I suppose, how archaeology is today. Um, so, for example, I uh, am well aware that recently the Institute of the IFA got its uh, a chartered status. It's now going to be the CIFA. Um, what do you think of that? Did you think that, the, that these are good developments for archaeology? Um, what do you see as being the shape of archaeology in, in, in the near future? Well, I think it's, at the moment, achieving a better balance than it's had for a long time. Uh, when I when I first became an archaeologist, field work was mainly done through universities uh, with um, gurus in the subject and a large team of um, non-professional, devoted and often very skillful volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was one of the people that did think that the profession needed to be a profession. Mm -hmm. We needed to be able to, once there was uh, the sort of developments where you had to speak up in relation to development, it was very important that we could have the sort of status that architects had. Mm -hmm. And indeed in my time I was the uh, cathedral archaeologist for Durham at one stage and I've done a lot with, sort of, I was the president of the church archaeology and so mm -hmm. on. And also when I was on the Ancient Monuments Board for England, I noticed that there was a divide between architects and archaeologists and that the architects got much more status in a way because they had a proper organisation. Yeah. To begin with, 
the um, IFA was seen, I think, by quite a lot of university people as something they didn't need to belong to because they were qualified already by having a degree. And uh, the fact that that degree didn't necessarily qualify them in field work mm. um, didn't always occur, occur to them. No. But um, now I think they do realise that this is a professional adjunct to their academic life. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that the people who were flooded into IFA to begin with, who are mainly from the newly founded units, of which of course, as you know, there were many more in the past than there are now, mm. Uh, those people, to begin with, were fairly defensive and they saw a union, really, as somebody to look after their interests more. And they have broadened out mm. their interests. And so I think that now we have a good balance and we're starting to say there is something that volunteers can help with too, mm -hmm. which in the early days of the IFA was thought to be not true, you know, you were a professional, we can't have things mucked up by people who aren't professionals. That's an interesting point that actually, because uh, something which, ha which has come up in other interviews that, that, that I've done has been the, the very vocal um, opinion uh, which has been sort of put out there by various usually conservative politicians essentially saying that the professions like archaeology should be largely voluntary. Now, I've always made the argument that, that where's, where is the, the carrot, as it were, for someone to go and become a well-trained archaeologist if they're, not, if they're just going to go into a voluntary profession. But also, um, the fact that, as you said, there is now more of a nuance and more of a, um, uh, an opened up approach to the You public. couldn't possibly have now a profession of archaeology that was just volunteers. No. Uh, the subject has become so much more complicated mm. um, and certainly field work has become much more skillful. I mean I don't actually agree with, very often with the fact that you just take off 20 centimeters properly and leave it uh, but nevertheless learning how to take 20 centimeters off properly is essential mm -hmm. and in my day and, I, and certainly when I first became professor in my inaugural lecture, I said I wanted to make our department a scientific as well as a arts department. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of, of scientific input into archaeology has been enormous. Mm -hmm. But it is sometimes quite difficult to understand, if you're the archaeologist, the nuances of that. So one's got to be careful, really, that um, the two don't drift off at all. Mm -hmm. But um, nevertheless, I don't. I think there's a place for volunteers, but volunteers have to be trained to a certain standard now before they're allowed onto site. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, yeah, precisely. Just, just as you, yeah, you, you wouldn't allow um, uh, interns in a lawyer's office to start uh, giving advice without training, which you? No, <laughs> no, no. Um, well, c coming back um, to to your career uh, and and your. Um, and your interests. Um, is there anything that you would like more people to know about when it comes to to the post-Roman world, in, in, especially in, obviously in the north of England? Is there, is there something which, which you think more people should know about and that, that they should that they should enjoy and relish? Well, I think I've often said this, and it's, it's in print. When I first came to the north, I was pointed out uh, by by the Romanists and prehistorians as the girl coming to study the paper cup culture because there was nothing there. <laughs> uh, and I think that what one's got to show is that related to the fact of England being made in this period, in other words, the topography changing, people settling now in villages where uh, they're still living. Not Durham. Yeah, <laughs> and bringing their own names mm. uh, for these villages. This is extremely important. The law of this land was made at this time. The settlement of this land was made at this time. The language of the land was made at this time. And except for one unfortunate invasion in 1066, uh, we haven't, uh, you know, changed very much since. Mm. Mm. And it, it's always been a great pleasure to me that with all the all the trouble the French took to try and make us speak French at that time and to take the English language away, mm -hmm. uh, we determinedly stuck out and uh, are still speaking English today and everything goes back to the same Anglo-Saxon world. Mm. So I think yes, um, 
I rejoice in the beginnings of multiculturalism and Englishness at that time. Mm, okay, so so, you, you, so in some ways you, you would like to see a more general understanding that of the importance of that time for who we are today. A lot of people, for example, point to the Romans for the beginnings of, lay, of say, law and cleanliness and all this kind of thing. But, but actually, we don't have Roman law, you see. In the continent they kept Roman law. Mm -hmm. We have Anglo-Saxon law. Mm -hmm. So I'm afraid I think the veneer of Romanitas was fairly thin, uh, particularly in the north. Mm. But nevertheless, I mean, one can't get away from the fact, and I wouldn't want to, uh, that I as far as engineering is concerned and, and quite a lot of structural things are concerned, uh, the Romans were way in advance mm -hmm. of anything that happened until about the 17th century. On the other hand, as far as, uh, as far as craftsmanship was concerned, as far as learning was concerned... Steel, for example. Sorry? Uh, and also metallurgy like steel, for example. Yes, yeah. that's right. All, the, all those things, they were very, very skillful indeed. And you've only got to see how people are amazed by something like Sutton Who um, or any of the new finds that mm -hmm. are made with gold and garnet jewellery mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and amazed by the delicacy and imagination of the Lindisfarne Gospels. Mm -hmm. You know, all of that is, is something we ought to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that uh, struck me from the Anglo-Saxon period that is English, and today we're constantly saying, you know, what is English, Englishness, um, it is a lack of pomposity. Uh, you know, so I think um, the Romans are slightly pompous, but um, there is a sort of pomposity and um, sort of self-esteem that the English don't normally have. They would rather sort of run themselves down. They might internally think they're very important, but they're not going to say it. And uh, that occurs already in the Anglo-Saxon period. Mm. Okay. Well, I have to say, as someone from North Wales, um, <laughs> you're a Welshman. I, I, I have a, possibly a different perspective on pomposity, but but we'll come to that <laughs> some other time. Um, but no, I see what you mean. Absolutely, mm. uh, that's a, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Um, I suppose next, uh, what um, for you has been the most satisfying thing about being an archaeologist? Um, is, is there anything in particular that, that that you look back and you're really genuinely satisfied by? I've had an extremely happy life as an archaeologist. Um, I think I was always meant to be an archaeologist. When I was very little, all I wanted for my seventh birthday was a detective set. And uh, so I think that, you know, I had the pleasures of that sort of detection and the intellectual pleasures and the physical pleasures. It, a life in archaeology, which includes field work, and includes academic work, seems to me to be utterly satisfying. And I think one of the things about it is that it exposes you as a person to the general public in a way that, you know, no other academic life does. No. Um, not, you know, professors of history or economics or something like that are not out in the world and everybody asking them what they do and what they've just found and what it means. Um, before they've had time to sit and think about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've been very grateful for the range of people I've met through my mm. field work, really, and, mm. and also public life. And it, it gave me an opportunity uh, to contribute something to public life, you know, in mm -hmm. various organisations for many, many years. I was on the uh, Royal Commission for Scotland, Royal Historical Commission for Scotland for 20 years. I was a trustee of the British Museum for 20 years. And in those two jobs, not jobs, but works, I met a whole range of interesting people mm. and had the chance to see not only wonderful landscapes, but wonderful objects. Mm. Just very briefly, um, touching on one of the points you made there, uh, what do you feel should be a healthy relationship between um, what I often term intrigue and integrity in archaeology. You touched on the fact that the public always want to know what's happening, and especially these days, often there's, a, there's there'll be a, maybe like a Channel Four TV series associated with, with something. For example, I'm thinking of Richard the Third. Um, it seems archaeology often has people wanting to get in there before the the pudding's cooked. You know, before the report is written, before the ideas have been solidified. Uh, you didn't really see that in history or, for example, in, in more pure sciences. 
Uh, what do you think the relationship then be between the academic pursuit and the, the rigour of archaeology and continuing to keep the public intrigued and informed should be? I think, you know, one has a duty to say to people uh, that when one is working either in the field or in another project uh, that one is like a scientist, one is testing something, one has a hypothesis that may be untrue, you suddenly see something else, mm -hmm. and that you should engage people in the search for knowledge, mm -hmm. not just um, the solutions. Mm. And I think we, we haven't been well served sometimes with television series that make one feel you can get an instant solution in three days. Mm -hmm. uh, it's taken some of us 20 years to get a proper solution to certain problems. Mm -hmm. And another thing about archaeology is you can only understand, well this is for field archaeology, what you find in the field, you can only understand something that you have seen already and understood. Mm, mm. And this is, I think, very difficult for people to realise. Mm -hmm. Once you have identified something, where it's a stain in the ground that you've identified now as a, as a post trench or something like mm -hmm. that, um, or whether it's an object that has never been seen before, and I've had one or two of those, I suppose, um, once you've identified it, other people see it and they find them too. Mm. But it's that sort of process and for the Anglo-Saxons, for example, in buildings, um, it, it's, it has, it's proved not to be very useful to say you attach an ethnic type to a building mm. and uh, it's too easy that. Mm -hmm. And the past is a complicated place, not just because there are people of all ranges of status and ability mm, mm. Uh, and we tend to put them all as one. Yeah, the Judas. Yeah. The part, <laughs> yeah, the people, yes. So uh, I, I, think, I think we have to understand that, we have to tell people that and I think if you can engage them in the quest, so to speak, and tell them that. I remember with students one day I, I went round and I said, oh, that's so-and-so, as I said, he said, oh, the student said, yesterday you said it was something else. And I said, well, yesterday I thought it was something else. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's, you know, you have to be honest in this way. Mm. So, so in some ways, accepting the fluidity of archaeology. Not just the fluidity, accepting that the subject is a rigorous subject, that you have to keep testing the hypotheses in archaeology. Mm. Um, so it is a series of propositions as to what you've got and what you are trying to find mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. and then testing that proposition and, and putting an interim conclusion. And you know, we all know who've reached my advanced age in life that um, you know, there are people treading behind you who are going to reinterpret things mm -hmm. and you have to be prepared for that too. <laughs> well, um, if, if only I, I had, I had um, findings to be reinterpreted by people. So, um, well, uh, it, it, it was it, it's better to have um, surmised and been proven wrong than to have never surmised at all. <laughs> um, but uh, nonetheless, um, so there's two more questions really now. Um, first of all, I suppose, uh, what uh, what challenges do you think face archaeology in coming years? Uh, obviously, we've just we're, coming sort of out of, just starting to come out of an economic crisis, but uh, is, is there anything that you think is really on the horizon? In challenges? Well, I suppose theoretically one has gone through uh, many theoretical models for understanding archaeology, and um, some of them survive in fragments anyway, sort of anthropological models. It's becoming harder and harder, I think, to use anthropological models as the world uh, swallows up the uncontaminated past. But um, no, I think as far as archaeology is concerned, the real problem in localised archaeology, the simplest thing in, say, field archaeology, is the lack of money uh, to be and time and uh, the understanding that things do take time to look very extensively and thoroughly uh, at landscapes and their 
and um, the settlements within them and their relationships and so on. So we have a chance now to look on a broad scale, we have a chance now to compare things worldwide. But it can be done so superficially as a sort of book mm. Uh, mm. exercise, mm. Uh, or it can be done with a small scale excavation, which can sometimes tell you nothing, or it can be done with large scale survey. All these things have to be brought together and I think we now need, particularly in British archaeology, to go back to some of the long term research projects mm. that did, as far as my subject is concerned and my period, give the results. Mm. 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 Okay, so almost um, a return to those sort of those career sites where someone really gets to understand and yes these days it's not just one person no. you know you have a consortium of people working yeah. and that's the difference i think mm. so uh, the final question is um do you have any advice for an aspiring archaeologist there are many people out there young and old who um either want to just dip their toe or actually become a professional archaeologist um do you have any advice that you would give to those people now, is this advice as to whether to read for a degree in archaeology or to become an archaeologist? <laughs> now, that is a distinction that not everyone makes. That's a very good question. Um, if you want, feel free to address both. You see, I think that uh, to study archaeology, I would say, um, you know, afterwards you could be anything. Mm. To become an archaeologist, you would obviously study archaeology. Mm -hmm. Now, to be a good archaeologist, I think, uh, to know if somebody is going to be a good archaeologist, they need not only the normal intelligence and inquiring mind for anything else, but the ability to see things and to look mm -hmm. and to remember very accurately what they have seen. Mm. Now, that is something that not every subject demands of you. No. But I think that it is absolutely vital it doesn't matter if you are dealing with objects or dealing with um, landscapes or whatever it is. If you haven't got that seeing eye mm. and the ability to keep it, keep your information, mm. then you're not going to be a good archaeologist. Do you think that's possibly because archaeologists deal with the substance of things? It's not just data at the end of a, of a process kind of thing. Actually, you have to form an opinion based on what you're seeing. Yes, I think... It's not just um, that you have to be able to take a large body of data. You need, because it's such a very varied subject in what you could come across. I mean, if you're in the field, all human life is there, as they say. Mm -hmm. And so any aspect of life might be there for you to recognize. Mm. But I was thinking more, I used to take students, the first year students, I always took around the town and I said, now I'm going to take you around the town and I'll ask you questions about what you have seen as we've walked. And I was often appalled at how little they had observed. Things like, I said, see how many dates you've seen. They never saw the dates on downcomers. Uh, they had missed all sorts of things in their walk, which they should have been clicking in mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I think that ability to observe mm and to take in a vast body of data and mm. sift it is something you need to be an archaeologist. Mm. I'd say that, that was one of the skills that um, when I was a toddler I always used to pull the pants off my grandparents with. I was always noticing things like dates and stuff like yes, that. Yes. So uh, yeah, uh, you're right, it's, that's very useful. So, so uh, aside from, um, from studying archaeology then, what about being an archaeologist? You, you made the distinction, what, what, what's, the, what's the separate bit of advice then for? Well nowadays there are various sorts of archaeologists you can be, aren't there? Hmm. And uh, if you want to be an archaeologist in, in a university then you've just got to have the, the sort of normal things that get you a university post. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Publications and research and so on. If you want to go into a museum then you've got to have those skills mm. and how to deal with people. I don't think there's anything intellectually different in being an archaeologist from being anything else. Mm. Uh, but it is this ability um, to be able to deal with the outside world and to observe things. It, it, you need a very keen sense of observation. Mm. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. That's uh, that's yet another interesting answer to that question. Um, well, there we go. Uh, hopefully this hasn't been too painful. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you. Well, good luck with the series. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.